you very much. Good morning, everyone. I um, hope you don't feel too drowned by Amber's fantastically big floors. I've got massive data. Um, but I'm about to dump you back under again. Um, it's quite nice to follow Amber, actually, and talking about the, uh, the Inglay project, because it provides us with some contextualization of what we're trying to do. Ours is a bit more uh, focus obviously in a period of time we're looking at in a particular type of archaeology, uh, specifically the, the excavated evidence. Um, our project is a four year study, very generously funded by the Lee Hume Trust and English Heritage, just in case there's any spies in the room. I know Dan's at the back. Um, I'm part of a three man team at the University of Reading, myself, Tom Brindle, and Alex Smith. Uh, specifically working with the data set under the guidance of Michael Fulford. Uh, and we are collaborating with Cotswold Archaeology, many of you obviously know Neil, um, <coughs> and I'll come back to their involvement uh, as we go on, and also the Archaeology Data Service at the University of York, and they are dealing with a lot of our um, outputs at the end of the project for the GIS and the website, uh, which is uh, very important in this case. And so what I want to do today is just to give you an overview of the project, um, look at this research framework, look at the types of uh, sources of information we're gathering, the types of, the types of data and metadata we're trying to analyse, um, and then uh, I'm going to be slightly self-indulgent and give you some preliminary results. Uh, <coughs> it's cool, but it's good to show as many people as we can so we can, we can recycle our thinking about the, the emerging data that's coming out of it. Um, and if we've got time, uh, perhaps we can go over some of the problems and the issues that we face, but if we don't, we can pick up on that in the discussion. So, the project uh, is, does what it says on the tin, really. It's an examination of rural settlement in England and Wales from the 1st century BC to the 5th century AD, uh, paying particular attention to the impact of developer-funded archaeology. Now, there, these have, as you know, created several major developments. One is that we now get large-scale excavation before and you know, digging around small holes and we, now we're opening up entire landscapes, normally multi-period landscapes, so we can see so much more. The other major difference really is that we're not choosing where we're digging, we're reliant on where the developers are building their houses or their roads or their channel tunnel rail links. Um, and that has an important impact on uh, Roman Britain particularly because we're not aiming for the villas, the towns, and the roads that we used to be, effectively the, what we used to think of as the Roman infrastructure, we're now looking at the farms, the field systems, the enclosures, the trackways, all the places where the vast majority of the Romana British population actually lived and, and worked. Now, as I say, we are focusing almost exclusively on the excavated evidence. So that's you know, slightly flawed in, in, in some aspects, but we are trying to use control data sets to, to alleviate that. Uh, I'll come back to that in a bit. But the, our reason for this is to gather more accurate chronological data so we can see more nuanced changes through time, but also to look at what people are doing, their activities, and for that we need to engage with the material culture and the environmental evidence which we get from the excavations. And this is just to show you uh, the exponential increase in reports that we're dealing with since the implementation of PPG 16 back in 1990. We've got this increase afterwards, but then an exponential increase really in the last 10 uh, 5 to 15 years uh, compared to what, say, Richard Hingley was dealing with when he published his book on Ro uh, Roman rural settlement back in 1989. It hadn't really uh, touched the surface, it must have been a million year later, I expect. So just to go through very briefly about the research framework, um, this massive new data gives us a chance to re-evaluate the countryside of Roman Britain. And what we're trying to do primarily is to tease out some of the broad scale patterns on a national and regional scale, uh, chronologically uh, and regionally. And we're going to focus on these six quite traditional themes, settlement morphology, agricultural economy, trade exchange, industrial activity, burial rights, and other forms of burial and ritual expression. Um, when I deliver some, some more data to you today, uh, I'll just focus really on settlement morphology and the agricultural economy, but we are do, trying to do so much more. And <coughs> we're hoping that the analyses of these different themes will give us 
some grounding to talk about some of the bigger questions relating to rural Britain, such as expressions of wealth, how does that vary across the country, um, in a, a social and economic context of land management, again, how does that change and differ through time, and also things about social and cultural identity, and things that we talk about all the time in, in archaeology. So, on to the HERs. We are utilising both published and unpublished archaeological reports to create our database. Uh, and I'm happy <coughs> to say that pretty much every single HER in the country has delivered us some reports <coughs> at least. Um, uh, you, as you can imagine, from the number of HERs around the country, this is no small undertaking in itself, let alone dealing with the published work. Um, so that's why we've got Cotswold Archaeology involved, uh, and they were funding, funded separately by um, English Heritage to uh, employ a team to actually liaise with all the HERs for us. So if Tom, Alex, and myself were doing it, we'd still be stuck in Surrey. We'd never get through all, the, all of that work. So they deal with them and send us reports, and then we go through, read them all, and draw data out of them. And there's varied responses they got from the HR. Some of them were very, very, you know, uh, positive and sent reports through in 20 minutes. Uh, and some obviously are working under very difficult constraints to do with money and resources. So uh, we tried to make the relationship mutually beneficial uh, by saying that we would pay for uh, digitizing all their reports that were relevant to us and we'd give it back to them, hopefully you know, giving back to the HRs and making their resource better and more accessible for other researchers in the future. Um, so this is uh, just an example of our database, what it looks like. That's the, the opening page. And th there are lots and lots of data fields, something like 500 once you actually go through the whole thing. But everything is on here from region to county, the, the different reports we're using, all the bibliographic uh, references, which is important because when we're finished, this will go up online, and you will be able to interrogate this yourself and there will be links to the Greylet reports, so you'll be able to click on a button and just read for yourself uh, if you want to do so. Uh, we're recording as many plans as possible um, because we want to look at uh, morphology and change uh, in those. And then we go through to a site uh, database where we have different levels of classification of sites, uh, decent site summary, um, some of us are quite concise. Tom likes to write massive essays, so you should get on with it. Um, and then we have you know, chronology uh, and geology and various things that you can, you can tackle. Then we go through to different speci uh, specialist data fields. We have burial evidence, looking at demographic data, um, grave goods, burial rites, burial style. Uh, coinage using uh, Reese periods to record that, and each <coughs> one of these has their, their fine summary so we can put in a bit more detail again so you can actually look at what these, these things are. Uh, quite detailed brooches, uh, pottery data as well, which is hugely varied reports are terribly very particular pottery, and we'll try and get some handle on that, as well as other finds. This is a particularly data rich site, so we've got you know, something like 168 glass objects and several hundred quern stones. So they could be huge, they could be, you know, some sites produce very little. And also the environmental remains, recording zoological data, uh, mainly uh, quantification data, but also looking at uh, livestock aging data as well, and also collecting plant remains, and mainly charred cereals. So this is where we are at the moment. Uh, we've got just over 3,300 sites in the database. Um, I started down in Kent, and then like the Roman army, marched mercilessly across the country, putting dots in everywhere. Each uh, colour you can see uh, <coughs> represents a different um, researcher on the project. Uh, so I did Yorkshire and the South East. We've just finished Yorkshire, uh, and so the bottom six regions are done. And we're coming to an end, it's getting a bit sparse up in the North East and North West, and we're currently <coughs> a battle plan to get through Wales. So these pie charts, very basically just give the ratios of where the sources come from per record. So the blue uh, are those built up from published sources. Sometimes you get information from Braylit which you can add to ones with the published sources because sometimes they're edited down, particularly in journal articles where they take data sets out and you have to go back to the archive and add in finds later or something like that. But the ones with red 
are the sites or the record, site records we produce purely from the Great Lit. And you can see you know, it's quite a significant proportion. If you did a research project like ours and didn't use this data set, you'd be missing a lot of sites. Uh, there's a weird pattern. Uh, if you go south to north, actually you're getting more Great Lit as you go north, more than 50% from the Midlands and Yorkshire. I don't know if that's meaningful, but this is... You know, you've got to appreciate this is a snapshot in time. As more work comes in, you get more grey lit, and then as some you know, more gets published, so they, they fluctuate. And as I was saying before, we, we are using, not like Anwin, who's analysing lots of different data sets, but we are trying to use uh, the NMR data, <coughs> National Monuments Records, uh, and the PAS as control data sets. So when we're looking at our spatial patterns, seeing whether this is just you know, uh, <coughs> due to where people are digging, or is it actually telling us something about what Romana British rural folk were actually doing in the past. So here, this is Yorkshire for an example, uh, which we've recently done. If you overlay, uh, you've got this sort of cluster going up the magnesium limestone through the centre of Yorkshire, and then you've got these dots going across into the Pennines, where there's not uh, a great deal of um, excavation, which is producing uh, rural settlement data that we've seen anyway. Uh, and then against the, the PAS data, it sort of filters out as you go that way as well. So it's very useful for us to look at. Now these are the uh, site types that we've recorded so far. Uh, we've got just over 5,000 in the database. And the reason why that's higher than the number of records we've got is because we can record more than one site type for each record. So it might be a nucleated settlement with a temple or something like that. So you can have more. So the major uh, <coughs> improvement, as it were, is that we've now got you know, over 1,700 farms in the database. And if you go back to Richard Hingley's work back in 1989, his ratio of villa to farm, so it's an arbitrary classifi um, classification, but he had twice as many villas as he did farms. We're now hopefully moving into a more accurate picture of the countryside, and, and as you can see, it's a huge range of things which we can work with. And we're also recording field systems. We have quite a large corpus of field systems from across the country, so we can expand our analysis and discussion beyond the settlement into the wider landscape context. So I'm going to begin with uh, just looking at rural settlement morphology and how we actually deal with all these farms across the country. You know, surprise, surprise, they do look uh, completely different everywhere you go. Um, but we need to find some way of categorising those, uh, but also moving beyond that you know, very monolithic villa, non-villa dichotomy that we've been dealing with up to now. So we've created a tripartite uh, system for ca classification. We are recording uh, all the plans where we can. We've got quite a nice corpus. 75% have, uh, have plans which we can record. 40% uh, have useful plans which give us some way of actually classifying them beyond uh, farm and 5% of you know, roughly <coughs> the entire settlement which out of 3,300 is still quite a high number. So the first type, very basic classification we're using is the, the unenclosed open settlement where you get all or, or most of the uh, domestic activity not obviously bounded by uh, um, an enclosure boundary. Uh, you generally need quite a large area of excavation to actually see these types of settlements. And interestingly, we've seen quite a lot actually have enclosures on them, but there are no obvious signs of activity inside. And you can see from the recreation they tend to, <coughs> they tend to be interpreted as a livestock corral. So we're looking at you know, styles of farming and the differences of uh, the farms, the way that the farms actually look. And <coughs> logically, from unenclosed to enclosed farmsteads, uh, with no obvious uh, <coughs> connections outside. These are classified as all or the majority of domestic activity contained within one or two enclosures. And the important thing to recognize with these is that there is very little evidence for differentiation of space within the enclosure. They're relatively simple, although there may be evidence of trackways or field systems around them. And then the third type of classification we're using is complex. We started with the terminology of linear, then went to developed, and then we ended up with complex because we feel it's the least meaning laden. But essentially, these we categorize as a, 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 con, a complex of conjoined enclosures, and importantly, the internal area is extensively subdivided. 
and this tends to relate to different activities going on on the site. And you can sometimes track these from the material finds and the features within them. Often you'll find trackway as being incorporated within the settlement as well, and many have the process of fuel systems radiating out, uh, out from them. Now, as I say, there is a huge amount of variation, particularly when you're going across the country. They, they all look very different, particularly the, once you start categorising those complex farms. Uh, and you tend to get two different types. This is one from Scythe in Yorkshire, done by Wyas. And this will be uh, a complex of enclosures radiate, radiating out from uh, a domestic focus. And then you get other sites like Clayton Pike, which is more like a, an intensively subdivided rectilinear settlement. But the important thing we're trying to get at is we're trying to quantify a level of complexity. Right? We can go drill down into this data further to look for this variation, but we want to look for this level of complexity and where it happens across the country. We also want to look at these sites, and I'm trying to understand them better, as I was saying, at the site level. So trying to get a, an understanding about how these farms actually worked. So, this is an example from the Upper Thames Valley, uh, where you get an area of domestic activity, perhaps livestock enclosures. Some of them, or quite a few of them, have evidence from industrial activity, metalworking, metal recycling, pottery production. So they're very self-sufficient, uh, uh, and, and lots have you know, trackways to link them to other their neighbours and other settlements beyond that. So I'll let you take that in for a second. These are the spatial distributions of different types of uh, different types of settlements. And I've used villas at the end just to contrast this. This is our estimated elements from, from villas. Um, complex farms tend to cluster around the central band here. They are elsewhere, but you get concentrations in here from the Fenlands down into the Upper Thames Valley, over the Cotswolds and into the Severn Valley. And then they sort of dissipate out there. And there are other areas where they're completely absent. If you look at the enclosed farms, they're perhaps more widespread, but they tend to, tend to exist in clusters, and in some areas they're the dominant settlement forms, so, so Cornwall, for example, you don't see anything else really. And then you can contrast that with villas, and they, they, what's interesting is they tend to mix with other types of settlements. So again, you've got the central band, particularly around the Cotswolds, uh, but also uh, in the southern chalk downlands, the north downs and the south downs, where you just don't really find these complexes. So there's different things happening in different areas, and the relationships between these types of settlements is quite interesting. Uh, and I think this central band is really, really uh, interesting because it seems to be the most dynamic in terms of different levels and different types of settlements you're all getting in one area. Now, if you try and look at this chronologically, uh, I've just used Yorkshire region and the southeast just to provide some contrast. These, show the f these graphs show the frequency of the different settlements uh, through time from the late Iron Age to the end of the Roman period as a proportion of overall farms. Uh, the green are the complex settlements, the red as the enclosed settlements, and the blue as the open settlements. Uh, the blue seem to be, you know, in both areas, uh, almost a late Iron Age phenomenon. Uh, you don't see them much in Yorkshire after the second century. And in the southeast, we don't see them really at all as you go into the Roman period. But the other two forms seem to cross over. So you've got a different looking landscape from the late Iron Age, which is more dominated by enclosed, uh, compared to the end of the Roman period, where it's suddenly, they're both suddenly become um, more dominated by uh, complex forms. Now, these two regions are very different when you look at the specifics of the sites. They do look uh, different, the farms look different. But what we're seeing here seems to be <coughs> an increasing level of complexity. That's what we're, we're gathering from this data. That's the change through time. And we can see these changes on single sites sometimes. This is an example of Lee, uh, Lee Farm in Hurst, where you get a late Iron Age phase, which is enclosed and also has some unenclosed uh, features with the domestic activity happening in that area. And then as you go to the late first century, you get a, a trackway plowed through the middle, still on the alignment of the earlier enclosure, which suggests some level of continuity. But then you get this mass, this complex of enclosures running up the side, and the areas where domestic activity is being carried out shifts. 
So that's changing. And a lot of this may be to do with you know, intensification in herd management because you get the, the links between the enclosures and some of them have funneled entrances and you can you know, imagine herds being separated up as they go through the system and then back out into the field systems again. So why do we get this change? What is actually happening? Uh, well, a lot of previous authors have looked to uh, an <coughs> intensification of uh, arable agriculture. So it's quite fruitful for us to take a look at that again with our, um, with our data. So if we start with some zooarchaeological evidence, these are the data from the southeast. Uh, when you accumulate lots and lots of these with a half decent sample size together, you start seeing a change or an, uh, an increase in cattle as you go through from the early Roman period to the mid Roman period. The blue is the cattle, red is sheep, sheep and goats, uh, and uh, green is um, pig. When you look at the variation of these data uh, uh, <coughs> from the different phases, you can see that the rise is caused by far more settlements producing higher quantities of cattle, and that causes that overall increase. So in the late Roman period, there's lots of high cattle, dots at the top is cattle. But in the late Iron Age, you don't even really have that. It's far more mixed, far more mixed. Similar pattern in the eastern region, again, you get a rise perhaps from the early, early Roman period again into the middle, middle period, a similar pattern that you see in the southern region. So we can't really explain these differences on you know, differential preservation. They, these are chronological changes that are happening through time. Uh, again, it's the same pattern. These are regionally varied. You don't get this so much in the East Midlands, so there are some differences as well. These are cumulative cattle cull, cull profiles, so they're calculated from recording the wear on the teeth of cattle to indicate uh, their, their, their estimated <coughs> age. And we can see that this also changes across the same period of time once you chuck them all together. So the blue line and the red line are cattle assemblages from the first late Iron Age through to the second century, and the green and the purple are second through to the fourth century. And you've got this steeper decline here in the early assemblages, uh, and the later ones seem to uh, be older, they're, they're living longer. This could be explained, I suppose, from the second century by more prime beef cattle going through to towns, because obviously this is just a rural data set. But in my experience, a lot of the Roman towns also have a predominance of adult and elderly cattle as well. So that doesn't quite fit. It seems to be more cattle at the end of their lives going to Roman towns when it's water, rather than the prime beef ones. Yet that's a general um, interpretation. The other interpretation is that these animals are deliberately husbanded to live longer, and that could be to do with you want more older cattle on the farms for traction and for ploughing, and that is a general trend from the southern part of the country. If we take a look at uh, some child plant remains, this is uh, spelt wheat, so we need to refine these data a little bit more, but we can definitely see from these uh, intracite abundances of spelt wheat against other uh, taxa. And we'll see an increase through time in uh, assemblages which have high, uh, high abundance of spelt. So effectively, farmers seem to be targeting and selecting spelt and choosing that over other types of, uh, other types of cereal as well. And we can contrast that with agricultural tools, metal agriculture plows, silos, sickles, and where we're actually finding that through the excavated evidence. And again, it pops up this central band through the country is particularly good at producing these types of artifacts. Also along the South Downs through across the North Downs and the North Kent Plain as well. But they tend to disappear further north you go, up into the Midlands. I mean, you know, we've looked at some soil maps and this can't exactly be explained by differences in pH. Uh, there's something more going on here. They, they pop up again in Yorkshire, so it's a bit of a map, and there's a few more <coughs> uh, going up there. So I think you know, that it's, it may also be to, to do with actual differences in farming styles, farming strategies, uh, uh, and access to these materials as well. We can also look at the field systems. This is data from the southeastern region, and the field systems are 
very difficult to date, but some we can get enough data from the boundaries to look at their periods of use. And we found you get a, an increase in the, in, in the fields which is used from the Iron Age into the first century, and then this odd kind of drop off from the second century through to the end of the Roman period. And uh, to be honest, I really wasn't quite expecting that. Is it that more of these fields are you know, not in use anymore? and more uh, land is being turned over to pasture. Perhaps we might expect that for uh, an intensity in, 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 in animal husbandry, cattle grazing. Or is it that I'm now starting to think is that we're not seeing less field systems. Is it that our ability to see the field systems is reducing? I.e. the fields are getting bigger, so we're not seeing the boundaries so much. Perhaps that fits in better with uh, an idea of uh, an, uh, uh, an increase or expansion in arable agriculture. Just going to throw some more data in the mix. This is millstones that we recorded from across the country. Again, we've got this central band distribution and also sites which are interpreted as mills around the Severn Valley, around the Fens, dropping down uh, there's the Neen Valley there, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, North Kent Plain. Uh, and also, this, this distribution is this very central, uh, <coughs> central, the central area. Again, as you go to the Midlands, they just start to disappear again. And also, as you come around this area to the south. So, millstones, you know, they're, they're indicative of a centralization of arable surplus, you know, more land to produce, more crops, more grain going in for industrial processing, effectively. <coughs> so, I should probably stop around over here. Uh, just to give you a brief summary, I think the data that we're starting to look at now is giving us a significant move forward to understand. Uh, better the settlement patterns, the levels of complexity and where this is happening in different areas of the country. As I've shown, we're getting these increases in cattle remains uh, and also uh, the targeting of, of spelt wheat farming, perhaps increased access to agricultural <coughs> technology, particularly within this central band, and perhaps changes to field sizes as well. What we've got to do now is get as much feedback from brains in the room and elsewhere around the country to really think about what this means. How do we understand this in terms of the production of wealth? How this changes through time? Why it happens in some areas? Why it doesn't happen in other areas? And what this means for society and communities in general? Thank you very much.